Earlier, we examined the different types of fault that can occur on the power system. Any one of these faults could happen in equipment such as transformers or generators or even circuit breakers. But more often than not, faults take place on transmission and distribution lines as they are more exposed. Now let's take a closer look at the effect of these different types of faults. To do this, we'll need to study the associated phaser diagrams. Here we see the simple three-phase system functioning under normal balanced conditions. The circuit has been simplified by removing transformers and breakers. The neutral is solidly grounded in order to anchor the system voltage. This phaser diagram shows the phase relationships and magnitude of the line to neutral voltages. Line to line voltages are also shown. Note that the voltage between lines A and B leads the phase voltage VAN by 30 degrees and similarly with the other phases. This we already learned in a previous tape. Now, let's see what happens if a short circuit occurs across all three phases at the end of the line. Referring to the phaser diagram, we see conditions at the fault location. In studying these fault characteristics, it is usual to consider that there is zero load current on the system. So only fault currents are indicated. This set of phasers also represents a three-phase to ground fault. The line voltages are drastically reduced, but they still maintain the same phase relationship. The system is still balanced. The magnitude of line current increases greatly, and it is lagging by approximately 60 degrees on its respective phase voltage. Why is this? Well, this angle is determined by the nature of the system impedance to the fault, that is, the generator impedance and the line impedance. The line impedance predominates and for a 115 kV transmission line this is usually about 60 degrees. High voltage lines 230 kV and up may have impedance angles as high as 85 degrees. Conversely low voltage distribution lines usually have a line impedance angle of about 50 degrees. Well, now let's move on to look at the conditions for a phase-to-phase -phase fault. In this case, the short circuit is between line B and line C. If you could place a voltmeter between lines B and C, you would find the voltage to be much lower than normal. Similarly, the voltage between line B and ground would be lower, as is line C to ground voltage. The phaser diagram shows this. The short circuit drastically reduces the difference in voltage between lines B and C, that is, VBC. This reduces phase voltages VBN and VCN and the angle between them to less than 120 degrees. This causes a change in the phase relationship of VAB, which is the voltage between the lines A and B. As we know, this is the difference between VAN and VBN. Subtracting these phasers, we find that VAB moves back in phase angle. It now leads VAN by less than 30 degrees. The magnitude of VAB is also reduced slightly. We can see that this phase-to-phase -phase fault has seriously distorted our previously balanced condition. Now let's look at the line currents. As we are considering zero load, IA is zero. The current traveling through line B is feeding the fault, and this will lag by approximately 60 degrees on voltage BC. Once IB passes through the short circuit, it returns along line C. So current IC can be shown at the same magnitude, but 180 degrees apart from IB. 
Incidentally, there is an easier way to construct this phasor diagram. First, by indicating only the phase voltages line to neutral. Here we have VAN, VBN, and VCN. Both VBN and VCN have been depressed in magnitude and phase angle due to the short circuit between line B and line C. We can show the voltage between line B and C like this. Similarly, VAB is the voltage between VAN and VBN, and in the same manner we can construct VCA as the voltage between VCN and VAN. The currents go here. IB is at an angle of 60 degrees to VBC, with IC the reverse of IB. Yet another common fault is the two-phase to ground. This example shows a fault between lines B and C, which in turn is faulted to ground. We have currents IB and IC flowing to the fault, and IG, the ground current, leaving. Thus, IB plus IC equals IG. The resultant phasor diagram is similar to that for the phase-to-phase -phase fault, except the depressed voltages VBN and VCN remain at their pre-fault phase angles. The current in line B and line C lags by a large angle, and this is complicated by the fact that some fault current is flowing to ground. Now here we see the conditions at the fault location for a ground fault on line A. The voltage between lines B and C remains normal, as do also the line B to ground and line C to ground. This is not so for line A to B and line C to A. In both cases, the voltage is reduced due to the fault on phase A. The voltage between line A and ground is drastically reduced. It could fall to zero if the fault impedance is zero but usually ground faults do contain some resistance and therefore a small voltage will remain. The ground current will be high as it is limited only by the impedance of the line and the return path to the grounded neutral. The flow of fault current through the ground path will actually cause a volt drop and a consequent rise in potential of the neutral at the source. This potential shift may be quite small depending upon the actual grounding arrangements. As before, we are considering in this example that the load current is zero. Therefore, currents IB and IC would be zero, and they are not shown. At this point, let's quickly summarize the types of faults that we have discussed and their main effects. First, let's look at the three-phase fault and three phase to ground. At the fault location, the voltage will fall close to zero, and very heavy fault current will flow in all three phases. As in all cases, the magnitude of current is limited by the total impedance of the circuit plus the impedance of the fault. In the phase to phase fault, the magnitude of the voltage between the two shorted phases at the fault will fall close to zero, and a heavy fault current will circulate in those two lines. In the phase to phase to ground fault, the voltage will fall in the two faulted lines, and a heavy current will circulate in these two lines, and also to ground. With a single phase to ground fault, the voltage of the faulted line to ground will fall close to zero at the fault location and heavy fault current will circulate through this line and return through the earth to the grounded neutral. The resistance of the fault itself plays an important part in determining the value of fault current. Indeed, if this is very high, there may be insufficient fault current flowing to operate the relays. All of the faults that we've been studying so far involve short circuits. 
There are other abnormal conditions arising from open circuits, but these are far less common. Let's look at a typical example of one phase which is open circuited. In this case, we'll serve to introduce the term ferroresonance. You'll remember from your study of electrical fundamentals that the term resonance refers to the combination of inductance and capacitance that can give rise to extremely high voltage levels. For example, look at this simple series circuit. We have an inductive reactance of 2400 ohms in series with a capacitive reactance of 1600 ohms. The voltage across the circuit is 8 kV. The resistance of this particular circuit is negligible. Therefore, the total impedance of the circuit is 2400 minus 1600 equals 800 ohms. Remember that capacitance and inductance have opposing effects. So the value of current through the circuit is equal to 8,000 volts divided by 800 ohms equals 10 amps. But what is the voltage drop across the inductance only? Well, here we have 10 amps times 2400 ohms equals 24,000 volts. Similarly, we have minus 16,000 volts across the capacitance. So although only 8 kV is applied across the total circuit, we have very high voltages in individual parts of the circuit. And this is precisely what happens when we have ferro-resonance in the power system. Typically, this can occur where we have a delta-connected primary of a distribution transformer. In this system, the distribution line is being fed from a Y-connected secondary with the neutral grounded. As this is a distribution line, fuses are often used. So let's consider the situation where one fuse only blows such that we have one phase open circuited. This situation can also occur where the lineman opens feeder switches one phase at a time. In the interim period, the transformer is still connected to the other two phases, and currents will circulate in this manner. The return path to ground is through the capacitance of the open line. So now look carefully. We have inductive reactants in the transformer windings in series with capacitive reactants between line to ground. Depending upon the specific values of capacitance and inductance, a very high voltage could arise across the transformer winding and also from the line to ground. This could damage insulators and the winding of the transformer itself. This condition is more likely to occur where voltages are 12 kV and higher, and also where the line capacitance is high, for example, with long lines or where cables are used. When you think of all of the variables in the circuits, this subject of ferro-resonance is obviously highly complex. But it is essential that we understand the principle because we shall be meeting this term in future tapes when we discuss specific installations. Clearly, in designing the power system, the engineer tries to ensure that specific values of impedance and capacitance will not lead to resonant conditions. Incidentally, you may have already perceived that one way of reducing the resonance effect would be to insert a resistance in the neutral of the source transformer. But didn't we already point out that we prefer to have this neutral solidly grounded? This is yet another example of opposing interest and compromise that we often meet in power system design. Well, at this point, we all deserve a well-earned break. It is essential that you become familiar with the concepts presented in this tape to assist in understanding the specific protection schemes that are discussed in later tapes. Please switch off the tape now and take time to thoroughly review this material in your workbook and then go through the questions.